Thank you so much for that beautiful music this morning that we've enjoyed together. I have to say, I, I can't remember the last time I visited a church and been uh, greeted more than I was this morning on the way in. Amen. So thank you for welcoming uh, myself and my family here to fellowship with you this morning. Uh, would you please join me in prayer before we open the word of God? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have revealed yourself to us in your word. And we ask this morning that you would open our minds, that we might come to know you and serve you better. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. My grandmother lived on a farm in rural New York. And my sister and I, she's just a few years older than I am, we were privileged in the summer. We always lived a, a, few, year, a few hours away from where she lived. But during the summer, we were privileged to go and visit her for about a week or two. And every time we would go to visit her, our older cousins, Teddy and Jimmy, would be there with us. And we had a great time together. But I remember one day we were all there together and it wasn't the best time we had ever had. You see, uh, my grandmother had discovered that one of her upstairs windows had been broken. And she found just inside that window at least one acorn. So it came time to eat and my grandmother was a very good cook. So we sat down at the table and we were hungry and she brought the food out and she set it before us and then she said, no one is going to eat until the person who broke that window confesses. Uh, that was not our thought at the time, amen. <laughs> so we sat there and she left the room, the food there sitting in front of us. My cousin Teddy, who was the oldest, my cousin Jimmy, uh, his younger brother, older than both my sister and I, my cousin Teddy turned to my cousin Jimmy and she said, he said, Jimmy, just confess so that we can eat. <laughs> Jimmy was adamant he wasn't going to. My grandmother came back and she said, now Jimmy, when you're ready to confess, we can all eat. Now, if you knew my cousin Jimmy, you'd know that normally that was a, a relatively good assessment of the situation. She left again. My cousin Teddy continued to prod Jimmy, just confess already, I'm hungry, I wanna eat. Jimmy was adamant, I didn't break the window, I'm not going to confess. So finally, my cousin Teddy turns to the two of us, uh, my sister and I, and he says, you know what? I'll bet a squirrel really broke that window, but I'm going to confess so that we can eat. I'll take the punishment. So he did, we ate, my sister and I thought Teddy was a hero. A few years later, we were together again, some family function, and, and we reminded one another of that event, and, and my cousin Teddy turned to us and he said, you know, I was really the one who broke that window. <laughs> now we thought Teddy was a hero, but he wasn't. And my cousin Jimmy had been falsely accused. Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? How did it feel? Or you knew that, that someone thought you were responsible for something. Something happened or something didn't happen that they thought should have been done. They thought you were responsible, but there was nothing more you could have done. How did that feel? It doesn't feel very good, does it? When things go wrong in our world most often, who usually gets the blame? What do you hear? God, why did this happen? Why did you let my loved one die? Why didn't you intervene? in this catastrophe. Why, God? Why? 
I want to address that question just a little bit this morning. But would you please uh, turn to Scripture? In Isaiah chapter 5, you've already heard uh, some of the verses we're going to be dealing with this morning. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And God himself addresses this question. And I believe that we have been given wonderful light about the character of our God that we need to share. Amen. Amen. And I want to talk about that this morning. Isaiah 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Now let's pause for a moment. Who is speaking in verse 1? It is actually Isaiah himself, okay? The author of this song. Isaiah is singing the song to his well-beloved. Who do you think his well-beloved is? It becomes very clear a few verses later. His well-beloved is God. Amen. He is singing a song of his well-beloved. His well-beloved is God himself. So God in this song, in this illustration, is the owner of a vineyard on a fertile hill, which means it's a good or bad location. Good. This is an excellent location. Now look at, at verse 2, what God does for his vineyard. It says, he dug it all around, removed its stones. And if you know anything about the uh, region of Israel, uh, there was a proverb once that said, Half of the stones, uh, that it's obviously apocryphal, but that an angel was flying over with all the stones in the world and dropped half of them in Israel. So this is no small task that he clears the stones away. It goes on, and he planted it with the choicest vine. What kind of vine? Choice. The choicest, the best. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes but it produced only worthless ones. Has God invested in this vineyard? Based on what we've just been told in verses 1 and 2. Notice that God first chooses the best location. He cultivates the land. He plants it with the best kind of vine. He hedges it in and walls it. He protects it with a watchtower. And if you have a watchtower, that means you have what? You have watchmen, guards, right? He's protecting this vineyard. And he's prepared a wine vat in the expectation of a good harvest. Having done all this, he is expecting the vineyard to bear good fruit. And I ask you the question, what more could this vineyard owner do? So he waits. And what does he find according to the text we just read? Does he find luscious good grapes? He finds worthless ones. The, in fact, in Hebrew, the word that's translated worthless, some versions translate it wild, literally means stink fruit. So he's expecting to find these luscious grapes, and he finds stinky, rotten, putrid fruit. Very appetizing, isn't it? Is it the vineyard owner's fault that those grapes were rotten? If we bring it back to what this passage is really talking about, is it God's fault that this world has gone wrong? Is God responsible for the evil here? I agree with you. No. no. Continuing in verse 3. Isaiah 5 verse 3 and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. Who's speaking now? God. Not Isaiah anymore. It's God himself, right? And God asks his people to do what? Judge. Judge. Judge who? Judge him, right? That's striking if you think about, think about it for a second, right? God is almighty, isn't he? Does he have to allow anyone to judge him? You know, when somebody has a lot of power, it goes to their head. They might start acting kind of like a tyrant. Things went wrong, but it's not my fault. It doesn't matter what you think. But God doesn't act like that, right? God says, judge me in this. Judge between me and my vineyard. Then verse 4. 
This is still God speaking. He says, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why? When I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? You know, God's question here implies what what many people believe. That some think that the owner of the vineyard must have done something wrong, right? And many people think there's evil in the world, therefore, God must have done something wrong. Perhaps he is responsible for it. But what more could he do? When I was younger, I had the privilege to grow up in the Adventist church, and I remember when I was in uh, the junior department, there was a series that ran in Guide magazine called The Sword of Dennis Anwick. It ran chapter by chapter every week in Guide magazine. In fact, I just happened to come across it once again in the Adventist Book Center. It's been republished, although it's uh, been out of publication for a little while. I still remember reading this story. In fact, it doesn't take long as you read it to find out that it's really an allegory. In this story, there's a young boy by the name of Dennis. And it's said in medieval times, we find out in the story that Dennis is an orphan. He's living with another family in this realm. And we find very early on, and it continues, that Dennis absolutely hates the king of his land. He despises him. And why does he hate him? We're told when Dennis was a young boy, the king's soldiers came and snatched him away from his parents. And he never saw them again. And for that, he absolutely despised the king. Well, a lot of things happen in this story, but two different things bring him to the truth about the king. First, he comes across a book that was written by the king himself. You can probably guess where this is going. He comes across this book, and the book was entitled... The Chronicles of Pestilence being an account of the dread black death and times following. I'll speak about this book in just a moment. But he also meets a young woman, who, a young girl who he doesn't know at the time, but turns out to be the king's granddaughter. And she also helps him understand what the king is like. And that's important for where I'm going this morning as well. But in this book that he comes across, it's written by the king, and Dennis reads the words of the king, and this is what it said, written by the king. It fills me with great bitterness, and my people hate me for it. But the dreadful truth about this plague is that it can be transferred from the dead to the living. By separating the living from the dead, I save the living. What does Dennis finally realize? That the reason why the king's guards had pulled him away from his family was for what? To save him. For his own good. Do you think that this changed Dennis' conception of God? Of the king, I should say. Did that change his view of him? Absolutely. I would submit to you that there are many people living in our world that still think of God the way that Dennis thought about that king. But there is much more to the story. Let's come back to Isaiah 5. We've seen that God speaks in verses 3 and 4, asking to be judged. Really, he's asking to be vindicated. There's a false accusation that's brought against him that needs to be cleared. And we've seen also that Isaiah was speaking in verses 1 and 2. He's singing a song of his well-beloved. Now, this is an important point, and I want us to pause just to make sure we don't miss it. In verses 1 and 2, we actually have more than one metaphor working at once. We've already seen the obvious one, which is a vineyard owner in a vineyard, right? Representing God and his people. But biblical scholars think there's also another metaphor, and they have good reason for thinking this, that there's also the metaphor underlying that one of a husband or a husband-to-be and his bride-to-be. The bridegroom or the husband is the vineyard owner who is God. The bride-to-be is the vineyard who is, in this particular context, Israel. Okay, so two parallel metaphors. 
This is not surprising. In other places in Scripture, Jeremiah 2.21, for instance, says, God says, I have planted you, he's talking to Israel, a choice vine, a completely faithful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate shoots of a foreign vine? It sounds very similar to what we have in Isaiah 5. Now, this helps us to understand this kind of strange language in verse 1, where Isaiah is singing, I sing a song to my well-beloved. This word for well-beloved could be translated somewhat loosely as a friend. But it actually corresponds to something in the ancient Near East which was called the friend of the bridegroom. You might recall in John 3, John the Baptist calls himself this when he's talking about preparing the way for Jesus to come. And the groom is going to increase and, and he's going to decrease. The friend of the bridegroom. In the ancient Near East, the friend of the bridegroom was the one who negotiated the marriage contract. There was a custom where the uh, bridegroom and the bride-to-be were not to have contact before the wedding. So if there was anything that needed to be negotiated, it had to be done by the friend of the bridegroom. And this is the role that Isaiah is playing in this song that we're reading about this morning. Now here, Isaiah is actually bringing a complaint against who? Is there a problem? There's a problem, right? Something has gone wrong. But it's not the groom's fault or the groom-to-be's fault. And Isaiah is making that case on behalf of the groom. That is his function as the friend of the groom. Now some think the groom is at fault, but he isn't. And that reminds us of just how God is not at fault, even though some people think he is. I want to submit two things to you this morning. First, what I just mentioned. God is not at fault for evil. He never wanted any of it. It wasn't supposed to be this way. And one day soon, God will finally defeat evil and sin and there will no longer be any more suffering or pain or sorrow or death, for the former things will have passed away. Amen. I can't wait for that day. Amen. Secondly, however, I would submit to you that this passage implies that there is a responsibility for you and me. In the meantime, while we wait for God to come and put an end to evil and suffering, who speaks for him? Who will be the friends of the bridegroom? That's right. Those who know him, right? To know him is to love him. And those of us who know that God is really good have a responsibility to help other people know his character, just like Isaiah is doing here. How many people, even now, that are not here with us this morning could be sitting here. They could be worshiping with us the God whose love for them is beyond comprehension, but they're not here because they think that God has caused or allowed bad things to happen to them or people that they love. Do you think there are any people like that? I think there are a lot of people. They wonder, where is God? Why has this happened? If we don't tell them how wonderful God is, who will? Now, I know there are some people that even if they knew exactly what God was like, they'd still reject him, right? People have freedom of choice. But I also believe there are a lot of people that if they truly understood what God is like and how much he loves them and what he wants to do for them and in their lives, they would fall on their feet with us and call him Lord. Amen. Fall on their knees, I should say. What more could God do in his vineyard that he has not done? There was nothing more that God could have done. So sadly, in Isaiah 5, verses 5 and 6, What is the outcome for those who finally reject God's love? There's nothing left for the vineyard owner to do but to remove his protection and his care for the vineyard. There is nothing more that can be done. 
This is a strong warning for those who reject God. But it's given in love. Amen. God is long-suffering. He won't force anyone to love him, right? But does God want anyone to perish? No. Certainly not. I'm going to share two texts. I'm going to do it quickly, but Ezekiel 33, verse 11, and 2 Peter 3, 9. Ezekiel 33, 11, and 2 Peter 3, 9. Two of my favorite scripture, uh, passages in Scripture. First, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, then 2 Peter 3, 9. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Amen. And I don't know if you hear that in, in your mind when God is saying that, but I hear tears in his voice. Why would you die when life is right here before you? 2 Peter 3, 9, very similarly. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not willing that how many should perish? It's okay if those people out there, right? Nobody. No matter what anybody says, God wants to save you, and he wants to save everyone, every single individual. It doesn't have to be that way for anyone that they would lose eternal life. But he will not force anyone to return his love even though it breaks his heart. What more could he do? If you look, look with me at Matthew 13 this morning, we're going to go to just two more passages, both in Matthew. First, Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. And as you're turning there, I would like you to imagine with me for just a moment. For some of you, this will be harder than others. But just try to imagine, put yourself in this place. Imagine that you are a young woman who's recently been engaged. And you are going to meet your future husband's family for Thanksgiving. You want to make a good impression, of course, right? You want them to like you. And you have baked them a fresh homemade apple pie. That, that should make a good impression. The family uh, is getting ready to sit down to eat. You serve the pie to everyone for dessert. And all of a sudden, you notice on their faces not what you were expecting. Instead of smiling, they, they can't hold it back. It's obvious that something has gone horribly wrong with this pie. And then you taste it yourself and your suspicions are confirmed. And you go over in your mind, you, you made the pie perfectly, you put all the correct ingredients in. Unbeknownst to you, your future sister-in-law, who apparently doesn't care for you, had snuck behind your back and put cayenne pepper and castor oil in the pie. How would you feel if you discovered this sabotage? What can you do? Was it your fault the pie was horrible? Something similar happens, but much more important in Matthew 13. We'll pick up in Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, verse 27, but I'll just summarize what's happened up to that point in that passage. Here in Matthew 13, God is again depicted as the owner of a plot of land. He sows good seed. What kind of seed? Good, good seed, but tares come up. That's a destructive, noxious kind of weeds. And his servants in Matthew 13, verse 27, say what? Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? What are they basically asking? What are they insinuating here? There's weeds in your field. You must not have done a very good job, right? And then, so then he responds in verse 28. 
an enemy has done this. I always like the way the King James Version says, this an enemy has done. Has a, has a wonderful ring to it. Who did it? Enemy. An enemy behind his back. So then the servants go on in Matthew uh, 13, verse 28. Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Again, what are they basically saying? Okay, so there's, there's, there's weeds here. Why don't we just take care of it? Have you heard people ask that question? Okay, there's evil in the world. Why doesn't God just stop it? Correct? He's all powerful. Why doesn't he just remove it all? Could he do that? He certainly could. But the answer to why he doesn't do that is right here in the text. God replies to them, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also what? Uproot the wheat with them. You see, God knows that if he simply exercises his power to destroy evil, without his creatures understanding what has really happened, they will not love him, but what? They will be afraid of him. They will fear him. So he waits in his long suffering so that everyone can understand his true character. In the meantime, he's calling out to everyone who will to come to him. And he commissions you and me to be friends of the bridegroom. What more could he do? Just one more passage this morning, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We see in this chapter that God has done the unthinkable. He loved us so much, he has done what I cannot imagine doing. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 33. Matthew 21, 33. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Does that sound familiar to you? What is Jesus basically quoting from? Isaiah 5. He is pointing his hearers, and, and they know what he's talking about. He's pointing his hearers to Isaiah 5. What more could he do, right? But he expands on this imagery. He goes on, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Verse 34. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Verse 37. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What more could he have done? He sent his son. Despite knowing that this world would cost the Son of God his life, he chose to create us anyway, to bestow his love upon us and suffer the consequences himself, receiving what we deserve so that we might receive what only he deserves. But I would remind you again that there are a lot of people that don't know this. A lot of people who still think that because God planted the vineyard, he must have done something wrong if it brought forth bad grapes. That because there's evil in the world, God must have had something to do with it. In the book Great Controversy, part of it, uh, in fact, more than what I'm about to read is in your bulletin, but in Great Controversy, page 492, by Ellen White, it says this, To many minds the origin of sin and the reason for its existence 
are a source of great perplexity. They see the work of evil with its terrible results of woe and desolation, and they question how all this can exist under the sovereignty of one who is infinite in wisdom, in power, and in love. Here is a mystery of which they find no explanation. And in their uncertainty and doubt, they are blinded to truths plainly revealed in God's word and essential to salvation. My heart bleeds for those people who would love him, but just don't know him. What more could he do? What more could I do? God has privileged us with a wonderful message about his character of love. I want to be a friend of the bridegroom. I want to tell people how wonderful he is. And I hope that you will do the same.